Hello, everybody. This is Jorge with Kittlesons and Associates Orlando office. Today, I'm going to be talking about using streetlight data for regional and statewide planning. I apologize in advance if you joined our Florida, Georgia um, streetlight roadshow a couple of weeks ago. I presented uh, on this very topic. Um, before I go into the projects that we've been working on uh, using streetlight data, I do want to share a little bit about our Kittleson philosophy for data analytics. Uh, we really think of data analytics as converting data into information with the goals of informing decisions. So we really put a lot of emphasis at the beginning of our projects to work with our clients and develop the list of questions that our analysis needs to answer. And ideally, it's the kind of questions that can then lead to to actionable insights. Um, I will speak on a couple of projects. The first one is our work for Metroplan Orlando. That's the MPO for the Central Florida region. They tasked us with running their origin destination analysis for their long range transportation plan, uh, also known as the 2045 MTP. We, we really uh, structured that work as answering five questions about origin destination patterns in the region. First couple were using historical data on origin destination, which was not available from Streetlight. The second one was uh, looking at origin destination patterns along our commuter rail system called SunRail. Um, I'll describe why we had, we tried using Streetlight data for that, but it didn't really work out. But the last three questions, uh, those did use Streetlight data. So the first one of those was looking at short car trips. We looked at freight and goods movement throughout the region. And finally, we just did a broad analysis of current origin destination patterns, regardless of modes. So the first one on historical trends. Um, so we really wanted, before going into the latest and greatest data, we wanted to just set the stage to how people are getting in and around the Central Florida region over the past 30, 40 years. So we went back all the way to 1990 and looked at census data on county to county flows. And we created these Sankey diagrams that you see here on the right, showing how many people are flowing from their residences to their workplace and how that breaks down across the three counties that make up Metroplan Orlando, as well as those other counties that are neighboring. So the story from these diagrams, like, like the first thing you can see is that these diagrams are getting really big very quickly. So the region has seen a lot of growth in population, and the metro plan area has seen even faster growth in employment. So you have more workers now in, in 2012, 2016, commuting from outside the MPO into, um, into metro plan Orlando to work. Nevertheless, I feel like it's still important to tell the story of the big picture. And that is that about 70% of workers live and work in the same county. So there's a lot of opportunities for those shorter commutes within, within the counties. Uh, SunRail, as I mentioned, is our commuter rail system. So one of the initial questions that Metroplan had when they purchased their streetlight subscription is whether it could be used to look at origin destination patterns uh, between the different stations along the line. Now, um, at that time, Streetlight did not natively support transit. And we tried a few workarounds, try to zone in on those station areas and see if we could get the trip flows between station areas, but there's some there's some limitations there that have to do how, uh, with how a trip is considered ended or begun that didn't quite let us get a, a really accurate picture of what was going on. So we instead resorted to looking at the SunRail smart card data that people tap in and tap out as they use the system and develop this arc diagram showing the, uh, the flows between each station and I like to approach this with kind of the squint approach, where if you just squint your eyes at it, you can get that, that big picture. And what comes out of it is really looking at those stations in the middle, uh, Church Street, Link Central, Advent Health, and Winter Park. Those could really be considered the core of the system. And they have the most attraction with the stations toward the, the end of the lines. So on, on either side, there's really not a lot of activity going end to end. There's not a lot of activity between those core stations or, um, or so, sort of from those midway inner ring suburbs to the core. It's really more from, from the outside. 
With that, I'll switch over to uh, some of the questions that we did answer with streetlight data. So for freight and goods movement, we looked at the um, commercial vehicle data set that streetlight can provide. Uh, we simply did one of those zone activity analysis, looking at, at all the roadways in the master plan or land the region, and the very simple map showing the, uh, the, the level of commercial vehicle activity uh, according to line thickness. The one on the left is using all the roads in the Metro Plan Orlando network. Um, and that, as you may imagine, will show that the highest proportion of freight movement is really happening on those limited access facilities, the freeways, the expressways, the turnpike, which we kind of knew, but um, it, it helps to confirm it here with the data. Um, the Metro Plan really wanted to dive a little bit deeper and ignore those limited access facilities for a second and focus on the the bigger arterial roads that you know that that they really can do more about and so by excluding freeways we come up with the map here on the right that shows a lot of the freight activity happening on uh, this core industrial area here in south orlando the uh next question was on short car trips and here we use the street light data gps data set that's coming primarily from cars or or driving applications uh, to look at places that had a high share and a high absolute number of short trips that we could define as being less than a mile or less than five miles um, so at, at the regional level we're seeing that about seven percent of trips of car trips are less than a mile which is it's uh, walking, if not biking distance, definitely. But then a, a big chunk is a uh, 46% is between one and five miles. So you could say that more than half of the trips to the region are within five miles. And, um, and this kind of data is really hard to get from other sources. I think the closest thing would be the travel demand model. And that may, uh, that involves a lot of assumptions. Uh, we then looked at, at this same data, but at a more granular level, looking at how different neighbors, neighborhoods and census block groups across the entire region um, had short, short car trips. And we found that in some areas where we know that congestion is a big issue, they also happen to have some of the highest um, share of short car trips. So you could think of strategies that could enable or foster a park once environment or to shift some of those short trips to uh, pedestrian and bicycle modes could really have a big impact in reducing congestion in those areas. Finally, we um, looked at the census block group trip table. Uh, so this is a plain origin destination analysis, uh, but we really brought it to life using some open source mapping libraries. Uh, and then a little bit of a, of a graphics touch to, to call out where um, the big activity centers in the region are and how connected they are to each other. Um, one thing that also came out of just this, this visual graphic, this is not really intended to, to convey the data and the numbers, was just how uh, spread out the region is in terms of trip making. There's no you know, predominant origin destination type that you can just put a bullet train and serve. This is really a, a sprawled out region and the trip data is showing just how connected everything is um, and, and how that relates to those activity centers that we, we are calling out. So I will now switch gears to another project. This was at the statewide level uh, for FDOT Central Office uh, and it focused on pedestrian and bicyclist safety. And it takes advantage of the pedestrian and bicycle data subscription that central office purchased a few months back before we get into how we use the streetlight data i will have a quick um quick uh, description of the fdoc context classification system which we helped uh, fdot develop uh, three or four years ago it's really a uh, land use classification system ranging from the more rural land use types to the densest uh, parts of our uh, urbanized areas in C6, C5, urban center, and urban core. And what it really does is help us design the right street for the right location, uh, right street for the right context. Um, as you can imagine, the level of pedestrian and bicycle activity would be going up as you move from the, those rural areas to those most urban areas. 
but without um, data, we couldn't really tell by how much. So we decided to use the streetlight data um, pedestrian and bicycle index alongside our context classification layer that we had helped develop for the state and just try to get a, a, a relative number for each context classification as it comes to pedestrians and bicyclists. And that's what you can see here on the bottom chart. Uh, of course, that C6 urban core has those highest numbers. So we, we pegged that at 100%. And then the other context classifications are, are based on that or relative to that C6 urban core. Um, one thing that was interesting was that pedestrians are, are even though that they follow that trend of rural to urban, there's a little bit of a bump when it comes to the C2 T, uh, rural towns, which are kind of the small town main street locations. Then it goes a little bit down as you get into the suburbs and they come out at a kind of steady rise up to urban core. But the bicyclist data is really mostly concentrated in urban centers and urban cores rather than uh, the suburban and the C4 urban general categories. Of course, um, part of our job is also to convey this information in a, in a less technical matter, manner for all kinds of audiences. So we uh, transform this analysis into a graphic like what you see here on the right, just telling um, designers and planners and engineers around the state how, how many pedestrians and bicyclists could you expect to see given the context classification that you're working on in a really simple way. Another uh, important way that we've been using this uh, pedestrian and bicyclist data from Streetlight at the statewide level has been to support our systemic safety analysis. So for a long time, we've really been working with, with an incomplete puzzle of crash data, uh, land use context, and roadway characteristics like number of lanes, speed limits, uh, median types, those, those kind of things. We really didn't have an idea of the exposure are the number of pedestrians and bicyclists that are using those roadways, and which we found that by adding a simplified aggregated version of the streetlight indices could really uh, improve our accuracy um, and help us prioritize roadway types um, by adding that, that missing exposure fossil keys. So uh, looking ahead, um, you know, first of all, I think we, we all realize that there's a lot of updates and changes going on with the Streetlight platform. So, so just keeping up with them is a big part of our task. Um, we also want to build on what uh, the previous session we were just talking about and analyze the COVID-19 impacts um, using Streetlight data. And then finally expand our systems level uh, planning and traffic operations usage of the data.